Good morning, everyone. Thank you for all coming to this presentation given by Taylor Bird on the topic of Gauntlet Golf Course Environmental Impact Assessment and Reduction Plan. We ask that you all uh, give your undivided attention for the duration of the presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that introduction. Now, how many golfers do we have in here today? All right, not very many. Okay. All right. Well, congratulations to the two or three of you that raised your hand. You are one of about 25 million golfers that enjoy the game in the United States on a regular basis. Um, now, have you ever thought about what goes into creating those pristine conditions that you get on a golf course? Um, I can tell you from experience it's not easy and it's definitely not cheap. Now, golf and the environment have always kind of had a give and take relationship. Um, maintaining those pristine conditions, as I said, is not an easy process. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of a balance uh, between creating those, environment, or those, uh, those pristine conditions and maintaining environmentally friendly practices. And uh, some of those conditions, or some of those uh, conditions that they run into are as follows. Um, fragmentation and loss of habitat is a very big issue that they run into, as well as um, the high irrigation requirements and chemical requirements that go into um, maintaining uh, large turf areas. Uh, such as uh, what we'll talk about. Now the Audubon International is a corporation that uh, delivers high quality environmental education to different businesses uh, nationwide and uh, internationally as well. Um, and the, uh, and uh, the Audubon Corporative Sanctuary Program is actually a program that has about 3,000 businesses uh, that they uh, provide this education to and provide certification to as well, which um, can be helpful not only to uh, they're uh, fiscally helpful to them, but um, uh, it, it, improves the, it improves their image as well. Uh, also, the golf industry has a unique opportunity uh, just based on the service that they provide. They provide very big areas of um, a protected area, uh, and we'll go into that more. Uh, now, the goals for this specific project were to receive the Audubon certification from, uh, for the golf, uh, the Gala Golf Course, which is located in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, and then within that, we also hope to reduce our negative impacts on the local environment, as well as promoting positive um, <coughs> environmental stewardship in the community. Um, and in doing these, we, also, we hope to achieve these goals in a fiscally responsible manner for the golf course, um, while uh, maintaining playability of the golf course. And for those of you who don't know, playability is the ease for the average golfer to get around the golf course. Um, and I'll try not to use too much golf lingo, but uh, if I do, I'll make sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. Now this quote is actually directly from a, uh, a, a article done on the project. Um, our goal with this project is not only to achieve the Audubon certification, but also to be a shining example of how a golf course can have a positive environmental impact. And this is actually by the general manager of the gauntlet, who also happens to be my dad, Mike Bird. Uh, um, and this is kind of my, uh, my personal connection to the golf course. I've been uh, I've worked there for many years, and uh, this project gave me the opportunity to combine my love of golf and my passion for um, improving environmental stewardship and community uh, all in my own backyard. Now, the first step in this process was to create a resource advisory group. Now, this resource advisory group includes myself as well as our management team at the Gauntlet, um, as well and, and our um, uh, our. Uh, <coughs> external resources within the Department of Gaming and the Fisheries. Um, we also did a site and management assessment uh, in April of 2016, and we used a, the environmental plan checklist that was based, um, that came directly from the ACSP uh, certification board. Uh, and these included five categories listed here, uh, and we used these categories to make a scorecard of sorts, sticking with the golf theme. And this scorecard is uh, scored as follows, uh, scored on a points basis. Uh, one point was given if that practice is currently uh, up to certification standards at the golf course. Um, a half a point was given if the practice is not up to certification standards but is underway. Um, there are practices in place, uh, it's partially, partially complete. And then of course zero points were given if that practice is not in place. And as of April 2016, this is where we were at. You can see there were some si uh, significant uh, deficits uh, that we had to overcome to com uh, complete this project, particularly in outreach and education uh, involving environmental issues. 
So the first category in the Audubon certification was wildlife and habitat management. And the first step in this process was identifying core habitats throughout the golf course and um, initiating protection initiatives for those habitats. Uh, the golf course is largely wooded. About 50% of the 160 acre property is uh, completely wooded and left undisturbed by patrons as well as the staff. Uh, there are also uh, wetland areas located directly along Curtis Lake, which the golf course borders. Uh, first thing we did was recommend, uh, make some recommendations to improve the wildlife and habitat management at the golf course. Uh, these recommendations were as follows. Uh, we recommend training of employees to be able to identify these habitats and to make sure they avoid disturbance whenever possible. Uh, we also created a, we also created some sub-projects within this to create some habitats around the golf course. Uh, we did some birdhouse, uh, we created, we built some birdhouses and put those out all along the golf course. I believe we built five of those. Uh, and those are maintained biannually by our maintenance staff. Uh, we also created some bat houses, which are maintained annually by our Boy Scouts of America volunteers. So we were able to get uh, the local Boy Scouts involved in this project as well. And then we also did the key buffer zones project, which I'll talk about more in the water quality section. But the key buffer zones project um, took areas that come into play uh, that border the um, that border the lake. Um, and in play just means more likely to be disturbed by the average golfer. Um, these areas. Were, over plant, or were planted with a uh, pollinator blend um, that only grows to about four or five feet tall. Um, and this makes the golf course a little more playable while offering, um, offering some habitat along the lake's shore. Um, and the last thing we did was a wildlife survey. And this was probably the most exciting sighting that we had out there. Uh, directly bordering the golf course, we were able to see some black bears out there. But we saw lots of animals out there. The first step in this was to put out these flyers and posters to uh, to introduce people not only to the project or to not only introduce people to the project um, and get people involved, uh, but also to uh, to start start the process of um, surveying what wildlife is located at the golf course. Um, and these this list uh, that was given to the public was pulled directly from a Stafford County local resource, um, a wildlife specialist that we, we uh, met with. Um, and it indicates the health of the biodiversity at the gauntlet. The goals obviously were to collect local uh, data on local biodiversity while introducing people to the projects that we were doing um, and attempting to uh, get input from the public. Um, and we used a citizen science approach, as I said, so we were able to um, use, utilize the 28,000 rounds or 28,000 golfers that go through our golf, or golf course annually, as well as the staff as they uh, constantly moved around the golf course. Uh, the results of this project were promising. We did get uh, a fair amount of submissions. Uh, however, we did not get quite as much as we were hoping for. Um, there were obviously some limitations. Uh, it started out very strong. Uh, in July and August, and as the fall and winter months came along, participation did decrease. So some changes that we may make to this project in the future or going forward are to uh, increase signage around the golf course and increase exposure uh, that, that our average player gets to this project. The next section was chemical use and safety. Our pest management records are um, available to the ACSP to obtain certification but are not available to the public so I wasn't able to uh, tell you exactly what's used um, but what I can tell you is that the golf course uh, applies pest management chemicals on a um, as needed basis so uh, whenever whenever a, a, a pest problem is identified um, the chemicals only used at that point um, and the recommendations that we made to the golf course were to improve their, pest, uh, their integrated pest management strategies uh, using alternative methods, um, uh, as for example, uh, cutting weeds out of greens using a steak knife, which is no fun, I can tell you that, but it is very effective. Um, and then you setting aesthetic and functional thresholds for the different pests, including weeds, including uh, fungal diseases, and including um, insects as well. Um, and these are all, uh, these decisions are all made by our resource advisory group, as I mentioned. 
And then uh, training our uh, training our uh, <coughs> our staff in visual monitoring. So improving visual monitoring throughout the golf course to make sure they're able to identify what pests are uh, on the golf course and what strategies we might take once a pest is identified. And then improved record keeping as well. Um, currently the <coughs> pest management records are tracked, however the effectiveness of the pest applications are not tracked. Uh, so improving that may help in the future. Uh, also our fertilizer applications, they're done on a regular basis and it's nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen is applied, um, phosphorus pentoxide, uh, and potassium oxide. Those are applied based on location, soil type, grass type, etc. Um, once or twice a year. Uh, the recommendations that we made were to base our applications on weather forecasts. That's a very important one because that um, obviously applying a uh, fertilizer the day before a big rainstorm is just going to cause more runoff. Um, and then application of, of slow release fertilizers, uh, particularly on more porous soils, um, like our greens, for example. Our greens are about six inches worth of sand. Um, and then monitoring soil health and soil testing as the budget allows whenever possible. Improving our soil testing gives the management a, a, the ability to understand what, what chemicals are needed and when, uh, and could reduce the need for uh, reduce the need for, uh, for uh, mass applications of these chemicals. And then rotating high traffic areas as well uh, to reduce compaction of the soil. Chemical safety. Chemical safety, the, the most important thing with chemical safety is training, making sure all, all uh, employees, particularly on the maintenance staff, understand what chemicals are used at the golf course and uh, the proper techniques with handling those chemicals. However, all chemical applications and handling is done by the uh, licensed applicator on site. Um, also, an S, uh, updated SDS is kept for all chemicals uh, that are kept on the property. The current issues that we do have are uh, particularly focused on storage, uh, particularly the off-site um, chemical shed. The chemical shed is uh, has poor ventilation uh, and is not fireproof. That is not um, against. That that is not a stopping point for uh, receiving the uh, the certification. However, our recommendations are to eventually uh, replace that shed uh, as the budget allows. As I said, water conservation is the third <coughs> section in this project. Uh, all irrigation practices are, or all irrigation is pulled directly from Curtis Lake, which is our bordering lake. Uh, and then 11 million gallons were used last year in 2016 between the months of March and November, uh, which is actually down from the year before, which can be attributed to a very wet month of April and May, if you remember how much it rained those two months. The turf grass benefits that we do have, our greens are all bent grass, which is a warm climate grass. Only covers about 1.8% of the golf course total area. However, it's cut the shortest length and it has very porous soil, so it is at most risk in hot, dry conditions. Um, so our recommendations for that were to, to reduce the need for water, uh, were to increase mower height. Increasing mower height by only about a 32nd thir of an inch can in uh, greatly uh, reduce the need for water on those, on those grasses. And then our fairways are a zoysia grass. They take up about 8% of the total golf course area. And the, benefits of zoysia grass is it actually goes dormant in dry conditions and in winter conditions. So they do not require water over those time frames. So in the case of a um, drought or when resources are limited, we let our fairways dry up first and they're very quick to bounce back once resources resume. Our recommendations to the, for the total water conservation at the golf course were the, to make decision making based off of weather forecasts and evapotranspiration rates. Um, best example would be to water, schedule watering times at night. Not only are there no golfers to get uh, spray with the sprinkler system, but the evapotranspirations are at their lowest point. And also to hand water hot spots whenever possible, particularly on greens. Uh, and that's a training aspect that can be implemented into the uh, training of maintenance staff. Um, being able to identify what a hot spot looks like and being able to know what to do in those situations. And that also 
reduces the need for mass, uh, the, using the whole uh, irrigation system just to water one particular <coughs> spot that requires watering. The conservation projects that we did were to reduce non-target watering. Non-target watering just means watering of impervious surfaces like parking lots and car paths, um, as well as watering areas that don't require water, like wooded areas. Like I said, the, about 50% of the property is wooded areas. Um, so to do this, we took 360 degree heads that were in place and replaced them with 180 degree heads that only spin halfway. Water quality management is the fourth se section of the Audubon uh, Corporative Program. Um, the gauntlet is actually located in the Potomac River watershed, even though at its closest point, <coughs> it's only about 3.5 miles away from the Rappahannock River. Uh, it also, all the surface runoff from the gauntlet and the neighboring properties to the gauntlet flow directly into Curtis Lake and Long Branch Creek. Visual monitoring was the first step in this process as well. We, we made sure that we were, throughout the process, we were identifying or looking for and trying to identify potential water quality problems such as excessive algae, uh, uh, dead aquatic species, things of that nature. Um, and then we also did water quality testing between the months of May and August of last year. And to do this, we used a YSI meter provided by JMU. Uh, we tested in these five locations. Uh, the first four locations were tested at a depth of a, between 12 and 30 inches. However, location five was tested at a depth of 12 feet. That'll be important here shortly. <coughs> water quality, the most, um, the most uh, important aspect of water quality that we found um, was the natural deviations in dissolved oxygen levels. Uh, as you can see in locations three and four, which were at a depth of, as I said, 12 to 30 inches, uh, these, these locations have that natural deviation of dissolved oxygen that comes from photosynthesis during the day and the absence of photosynthesis at night combined with uh, decomposition, uh, consumption of the oxygen due to decomposition of organic material. Uh, location five, um, as you can see, reaches much uh, lower levels of dissolved oxygen, actually zeroing out at night. And this is indications of eutrophic conditions, which basically means the absence of oxygen. Now this is caused by, uh, usually caused by excessive algae um, in the water as well, and excessive algae is often caused by uh, nutrient pollution in the water. Our recommendations were administrative controls, as I said before, to the amount of nutrients being applied to the golf course um, and reducing mass applications whenever possible and then improving our buffer zones which I will which leads me right into our key buffer zone project which was our um, project for reducing environmental or reducing um, or improving water quality excuse me the buffer zone is basically the area between the managed turf on the golf course and the water's edge uh, five locations were selected uh, as as every other area is, uh, every out of play area is uh, left undisturbed and naturalized. However, these areas are locations that come into play, and our goal was to uh, improve these buffer zones while improving the playability of the golf course as well by planting low growing plants. Each zone was seeded by a pollinator with a pollinator blend of different flowering plants, uh, and this was. Uh, through, uh, this was given to us by a uh, local resource at the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. Uh, and planting was done on April 1st of this year. Um, this was also the major focus of the Freelance Star article, which as I said before, is our Fredericksburg local paper. Um, as you can see down here, all the green top stakes and the signs that were put out indicate that that area is a no search protected area, which means it is off limits to not only our staff, but our patrons as well. And all patrons are informed of that when they, uh, when they check in at the front desk. These were the five locations. This is hole two right here. Hole three goes across, four cuts around there, and five goes right through there. So as you can see, all of those locations are in play, however, any other location around the edge of the, of the water is left naturalized. The final section is outreach and education. Um, outreaching about this project to our local, our local players as well as outside of our 
um, our golf course family was very important. Uh, our monthly newsletter included updates and information about this project consistently. Uh, and uh, we, our, our goal was to get as many people included in this process as possible. Uh, we opened up the doors to our resource advisor, or for our, of our resource advisory group, to anyone who wanted to join uh, that was a patron or a member, staff, anybody was open to it. Um, and there are many volunteer opportunities at the golf course. As I said before, the Boy Scouts of America uh, in the area are volunteering, as well as the um, wildlife survey opportunities for a volunteer. Um, and we are very fortunate to um, be able to um, get exposed to even more people with the Freelance Star article that came out. Uh, also, we're very proud to host the Fredericksburg Golf and Sports Academy, particularly our junior program. Our junior program allows us to expose the youth of the community to these projects and to the benefits of environmental stewardship and setting a good example as well. So this is where we are as of April 15th of this month. Um, as you can see, we've made drastic improvements in every category, particularly outreach and education, which was our first category to reach 100%. Uh, all categories require 100% for certification, except chemical use reduction and safety. That does not require 100%, it requires 87%, as there are some recommended practices that are not required. However, at the Gauntlet, we're striving to reach those, reach 100% in all categories. This process will continue under the, under the, uh, under the resource advisory group supervision, um, and I will continue to be a part of that uh, as well. Um, all practices will continue um, until we reach certification and beyond, so we can maintain that certification beyond uh, when we eventually reach it. Um, and then training is going to be very important, particularly in this upcoming um, hiring seasons of April and May, when golf courses normally do their hiring. Uh, training employees, particularly on the maintenance staff, to be able to identify pest problems, be able to identify water uh, hot spots on greens, and to be able to identify habitat, uh, habitat of local wildlife and know what to do in those situations. And as of now, we're on track to receive this certification by August 1st of this year. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Brent for being a huge help throughout this process, not only uh, during the school year, but in the summer as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank Kyle Snow for being very helpful um, in getting this project complete. Uh, I'd like to thank Mike Bird, my dad, Liz Reese, uh, and everybody else at the Gauntlet Management and staff, uh, as well as our members and patrons who uh, participated in this project. Uh, and I'd like to thank David Whitehurst and Ron Hughes, who were uh, our local resources with the Department of Gaming and the Fisheries, as well as Matt Dye, who was our Stafford County local wildlife expert. And then Amanda Vicenzo with the, uh, the, with, the Virginia, uh, with the Freelance Star, who was able to not only expose us to our patrons at the golf course, but the entire community of Fredericksburg and Stafford. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? I have several questions, but okay. let's start with the first one. Um, on the, the, score, the, the, the score sheet for the certification at the mm -hmm. end there, you sort of showed where you made progress and you have to be aiming for, for um, hitting all of them. Yeah. Uh, in my experience with other similar score sheets that the university has done, my role knows, um, some are real expensive to get and others are pretty easy. I presumably outreach and education is the kind of low hanging fruit. Can you talk about um, the, the process by which you decide, you know, here's what we're going to go after first, and then some of the challenges in getting to that 100% level, which seems awfully high yeah. for, you know, to have to hit everything. So. Yeah, so basically the, there was, uh, as I said, there was a, a checklist that was provided by the ACSP that gave us, you know, all these different practices to reach that level. Each one was a point, so 20 total practices in, in wildlife management and things like that. Um, and we basically what we did in April was we tried to figure out you know what we do well already um, and what's not a focus and then tried to find our major focuses um, that we wanted to, to uh, move forward with throughout the summer uh, and fall months um, so I met with as I said our resource advisory group um, as well as Dr. Brent and we figured out what was going to be the most important things and what was going to be the uh, 
the best way to go about doing that in the in the best uh, fiscally responsible way for the golf course. Because as I said, we, we do have a limited budget um, of only about three hundred thousand a year for maintenance purposes. Um, so we had to make sure everything was within that budget. Can I ask a related question then? Um, if you purely view it as a business prospect then, and say, let's say we don't care about the environment, we're, we're purely self-interested in terms of making money, um, is there any way you can justify it from a money-making perspective? That is, does the increased exposure that you get, or, or do you draw in some additional golfers um, because you have um, a, a more environmentally friendly uh, 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 perception? Or is there, is there any way you can make the case that there's actually good business practice, not just good for the environment? Well, that was kind of what we talked about. It is a good business practice to be environmentally friendly, um, particularly in an area that's as competitive as Fredericksburg is with multiple different golf courses in the area. We wanted to have a step up, but it's also just an important, um, important thing in, in, uh, in our company. Uh, our company actually is owned by Golf Course Specialists, which owns all three golf courses within the uh, Washington, D.C. area. And at the time that we began this project, they all were certified under the Audubon Society. So we wanted to, that's just an important thing within uh, our company and it's a core value. All right. Well, can I ask another question? So I actually wasn't one of the people who's gone on golf watch anymore, but so you talked about sort of playability versus um, environmentally friendliness. The only thing that kind of piqued my ears was you talked about um, increasing the, the mowing height of, of on the greens, yes. which I'm, I'm a fan of slow greens, but many people I know really like quicker greens. Did you get pushback on that? Because presumably if they're longer, they're slower. That's what, in my experience. I mean, yeah. you're not talking about that much, but even on, you know, even on a little bit on a green can make a big difference in terms of, of how it plays. I mean, did you get people saying, oh, you know, what's, what's up with the greens? Or? Well, we, we, we always have people <laughs> that are not happy with the speed of our greens. Um, but what I can tell you is our greens are actually very sloped. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, PB Dye, who designed the gauntlet, um, but he's notorious for having very sloped greens and very tiered greens. Um, so that's an important thing for our golf courses to make it playable and a little bit easier, even though there is some pushback from some of the better players, yeah. that's something that we try to keep is our greens a little bit more playable than, um, I mean, if you have greens that are rolling at, at a 10 on the stint meter um, that are that sloped, it's, yeah. it's not fun. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, it's painful, so. All right. Thank you very much.